welcome everybody. Today we have a very important interview about domestic violence. Our guest today is Chow Nguyen. Thank you so much for joining us, Chow. Well, thanks for having me. Chow is, works with the Houston Area Women's Center, and we're going to get all into that. But one of the things that Bridget and I were really noticing in the media was that there's a horrible spike in domestic violence during this time of COVID. And we really thought it was important to discuss the topic. So um, Chow was very generous in coming on quickly mm -hmm. <laughs> to yes. discuss it. And I thought we'd start out by just explain, can you explain to our listeners about domestic violence? What falls into the category of domestic violence? Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Colleen and Bridget. It's so important that women reach out to other women and support other women, especially during this time. Um, a lot of people, when they think about domestic violence, they think uh, they go, their head goes straight to physical violence. And we know that's a manifestation, that's a form of domestic violence, but really it's a pattern of abusive behavior in any relationship that's used by one pa partner to maintain power and control over the other partner. They can do it through uh, fear, intimidation, threats, um, stalking, all of those actions to influence another person. So at the root of domestic violence is power and control. I'm going to exert my power over somebody else. And I do it through physical violence, emotional violence, uh, abuse, words, uh, behavior like stalking, checking on your cell phone. So that's what we see as domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Now, people who are in a situation, because it could be men or women, it's not just women who are subject to domestic violence. A lot of times it's, it's hidden, it's not talked about. Mm -hmm. And why do, you why do you think it, women, I, I know they're afraid for their lives, obviously, yeah. that's a given. But why do you think a lot of people outside of their uh, circle don't want to talk about it or don't want to get involved? Yeah, it speaks to the shame and stigma that we've had around domestic violence for decades, right? So at the turn of the women's movement in the late 70s, the agency where I work, the Houston Area Women's Center, was born. It was born as a result of women calling the city of Houston and saying, hey, I'm in an abusive relationship. What can I do for support? I have nowhere to go, et cetera. So that shame and stigma and keeping it behind closed doors has stuck around for decades. But what we're seeing more and more, and this is the good news, is people are talking about it and people are recognizing that while it's a matter, it is not private. And by that, what I mean is it spills out into communities. Think about this. If there's a domestic violence situation, an abusive relationship, and the police get called, then the first responders you know, are part of this domestic violence web. Children who are witnesses, the hospital, uh, hospitals that have to treat survivors, entire communities are affected, school systems, counselors. So it's not a private matter, it is a public matter. And it's actually a public health crisis. You know, we talk about the pandemic right now being this, this, this huge crisis. Can you imagine if every day we reported on the numbers of women and victims who were violated, who were abused, and then talked about the mortality rates, it would be severe. It's, it's in those pandemic levels. That's mm -hmm. why it's so wow. serious for us as you know, community-based organizations to talk about this and to tell women and survivors and men and children that they're not alone, that there's help. Whether there's help in Houston or wherever people are listening, there is help available. There are many community-based organizations and domestic violence shelters that operate. And you were saying off air that if you call the national hotline number, which is 800-799-7233, it will take you to a local community program in your area, correct? Yeah, they, they, that's a national domestic violence hotline set up to not only offer support to survivors, sometimes you know, survivors will call and they may not need that safe refuge immediately. They are in crisis. They may not need that, but they need support. So uh, the National Hall can offer support, but they can also offer resources and patch you to the right organizations in, in their communities. Can you talk a little bit about what the Houston Area Women's Center offers? And maybe, I don't know how it would be compared to other centers across the nation. Yeah. Uh, we offer a breadth of services. We offer crisis response, survivor empowerment, and violence prevention. It's kind of our three-pronged approach into offering support and care for survivors. By that, I mean through crisis response, we respond to survivors through our shelter, 
our 24-7 hotlines which access resources into the agency. Uh, and then to empower survivors, we offer counseling services, a housing program, vocational education, financial empowerment programs. And then with violence prevention, we have outreach counselors and educators who go out to the community and talk about how to stop the violence before it starts. So that, that sort of violence prevention component. Um, there are many other organizations around the country who do what we do. We're lucky to have this. Uh, we're the fourth largest country in the uh, city in the country. So, so our support services include hotlines, 120 bed shelter, which is a pretty large shelter to run, um, mm -hmm. you know, violence prevention program, uh, a team of counselors and advocates, all of whom right now have had to uh, quickly pivot their services remotely and offer it virtually. And that's mm -hmm. what you're seeing across the country. And you may have noticed, you guys talked about this, is that you are seeing this spike in domestic violence calls because survivors are now finding themselves in greater isolation with abusers. So can mm -hmm. you imagine your, your home might be a refuge because maybe your partner's out working or the kids are at school, so you've got some downtime now, your home. Now, as these um, stay-at-home orders begin to lift across the country, it'll be interesting to see you know, during this uh, quarantine period what it looks like. Here in Houston, we can tell you there has been a do domestic violence spike in calls to our agency, to police, uh, to police officers. So we're looking at these numbers really seriously and, and we're taking a, a very aggressive, proactive approach to reach survivors. We launched a citywide campaign called nocovidabuse.org to address this issue, to let survivors know that there is an option. They can call for help. The shelters are safe because people are scared about going to communal living like the shelters, practicing social distancing, sanitation measures, those kinds of things. And hopefully across the country, as you see all these stories, right, in the newspapers and in the media, that that, that kind of message is being sent. Well, that's, I wanted to get into that, the hashtag no COVID abuse. And you were saying that now you're in isolation, which is just even more frightening to think that you're alone for days on end with your abuser. It's also the economic stress that people aren't working now. So yeah. the level of stress is is exacerbating the abuse as well, correct? It is. Uh, you know, we monitor phone lines at our hotlines and I've had a chance to talk to our advocates about what they're hearing because we wanna share it with the media and we wanna share it with the community to talk about how uh, serious this issue is. And we've heard calls where nurses have come home from 12 hour days only to you know, be with an increasingly violent partner who's threatening to kick her out because she's got COVID, um, you know, taking away hand sanitizers from, from survivors um, and then survivors being afraid of going to a shelter, like I said, because they're scared that their kids might catch COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and one of the options we offer to survivors is, do you have a place to go if your home isn't safe? Well, then survivors are telling us, you know, family members don't want to take me in because of the fear of this, this coronavirus. So the stories we're hearing are pretty desperate and that isolation causes further stress. You're talking about loss of job and that financial constraint. Um, yeah, this is a really serious time and that's why we've made our voice and the voices of other domestic violence providers um, very loud and clear that, you know, this is what's going on and we've got to support women and children and men in our communities because things are grave and their lives are on the line as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, go ahead. Oh, oh, you said you, you all were taking precautions at the shelter, so you are able to take people at the shelter at this time. Yeah, so all domestic uh -huh. violence, most domestic, well, I wouldn't say all, I don't know all 50 states, but most domestic violence shelters that we have heard of um, remained an essential operation throughout this pandemic. We did at the Houston Area Women's Center. The shelter you know, never shut down. The phone lines never went silent. In fact, we ramped up our services to include our Safe Harbor Hotel Emergency Stay Program. That's not a service that we offer um, we offer often, right? Mm -hmm. but, but when a survivor calls and she is in a grave lethal place, there's an assessment we do, a danger assessment we do on the telephone. If she's in serious danger, then we can get her into a cab, or her and her family or, or him, we've, we've housed male survivors too uh, in hotel stays and get them into safe harbor for the time being until we can figure out you know, where we can place those survivors. And so far we've placed about 60 
women and children and men in the Safe Harbor Hotel program. So, uh, you know, we, we believed as an organization, we got to do what we can to prevent uh, homicides. Like we saw after Hurricane Harvey, because we know that in times of crisis and disaster, violence spikes. It's a fact. It's been well documented. We saw it after Hurricane Harvey that, you know, devastated the city of Houston. Um, there was a 45% spike in domestic violence murders against wow. women in our city. So we are, we don't want to see that happen again, not on the city's watch. And so we launched that no COVID abuse campaign with elected leaders, with the mayor of Houston, uh, with other community-based organizations and domestic violence providers to uh, let survivors know that help is available. And we also offered tips for managing the stress at your house. I mean, it, you know, and, and, and if you haven't been exposed to this, can you imagine just being on alert and say, I know where the guns are in case my partner goes after the guns. I know where the safe exit is. I don't want to have to hide. Don't go hide in a bathroom because then you're stuck. Don't go into the kitchen because there's weapons, right? Knives can be weaponized. Um, give your child or a family member or a friend a code word in case you need to use that code word so that they can call 911. Have your cell phone uh, with you at all times, fully charged. Know where the keys to your car are because these are the things, that's called safety planning. Uh, these are the things that can save your life because leaving does not equate to safety. It's actually the most dangerous time. When somebody decides to leave and the moments they decide to leave, that's the most dangerous time. The lethality rate goes way up. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. my next question to you mm -hmm. because I know you, uh, in doing the research, they say leaving is the most dangerous time. Yeah. What can you do to, su what suggestions do you have for someone who has made the decision that it's time to get myself or my children out of the house? What can they do to yeah. make it the safest transition? Safety planning is paramount to be safe. And we have, uh, through our hotlines, and by the way, you don't have to live in Houston to call the hotlines and safety plan. We have advocates who can help you uh, plan your safety by a myriad of those questions I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Where are your car keys? Do you have your uh, pa passport? Uh, Do you have your documents in place? Have you made a plan to get out safely? Because the reason why what we see is that that leaving does not equate safety is because you know things are um, elevated and escalated, right? Emotions run high when somebody decides to leave and an abuser loses that power and control. So safety planning, there are you know safety plan assessments that advocates can do on hotlines. You can go to our website, we can offer safety planning for you. And, and, and it is a list and a host of questions. You just got to get ready if you decide to leave. The other thing I want to say is, you know, it's, it, people say there's, there's how you respond to a survivor, right? So people go, well, why don't they just leave? That is not supportive. Telling somebody mm -hmm. you should just leave because he's a jerk is not supportive. It doesn't establish trust with your friend who might be sharing this. It really is their options to give them the tools to to realize, yeah, I do have an option. These are these are the things I am going to do. I've heard those stories working here at the Houston Women's Center uh, time and again, those stories of transformation and the courage it takes to say, I'm done, I, I cannot take any more, and I've left safely. And many of our survivors have left with nothing but the clothes on their backs and started anew. I, and I think that's the important thing is, is I think there's this fear that, you know, I, uh, financial empowerment is sort of the, the, one of the biggest barriers to leave, right? Like, I don't have enough money. Who's going to support my kids? My partner or my husband's the breadwinner. Help is available. You know, we've got those resources and those tools to help a survivor start and begin again anew. And, and these stories I've heard are incredible of transformation. Mm -hmm. And that was a, another thing. Um, you're so good at this because you, you know exactly what you're going to ask. You're answering the questions before yeah, we ask them. <laughs> that was, I think that's a big factor is a financial insecurity. And also that's another form of abuse is, it is. holding finances, you know, oh. that people don't think about um, somebody controlling all the finances to where the uh, abused person can't even have access to money. I would say that's 95% of the time. What we hear from survivors, it's money and kids holding those against you. Sure, sure. And, and the fear of if I leave, what do I do? Where do I go? How am I going to support myself and, and the kids? Mm -hmm. And then just even the, you know, you're going to have to go through some court uh, courtroom sessions 
over the custody of the children. And the expenses involved in getting an yeah. attorney or going to court. Just everything. She's a former attorney. I'm a former uh, elementary school teacher. <laughs> so I've seen it from the elementary school and having to call. Yeah. Because if, if a child tells you anything with any form of violence, it's your duty by law. Now, I was a teacher in Kentucky, but you must call. You yeah. must call about that. You need to report. I'm a social worker. I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you have to do that. And um, I, I see that so much as that is, the, are the children going to be safe? I'm going to have to go through all of this at court, you know, and fight for this. And I know that's got to be daunting, but it's so comforting to know that women have these things. People can help you. Oh, we have, have these issues. I will tell you, I am amazed every day at some of the advocates who work for us, who've been there for decades, right? And mm -hmm. really do this because they want to see somebody else um, uh, achieve independence and self-determination. I think this is what keeps us going as a movement to end violence, as advocates. Um, you know, I'm very passionate about this. I really believe that women and children um, uh, can live self-determined lives, free and independent of independent of violence. Um, we're constantly out there teaching people, raising that awareness that they can recognize those resources that are available. But speaking mm -hmm. of recognizing, I do want to share something that I think is really important for your listeners. And it's what we call the three R's, mm -hmm. right? Recognize, and it's used in different contexts, but recognize, respond, and refer so if somebody's sharing that they're in a, an abusive situation or relationship, that you're recognizing the signs, that you're being supportive, using things like active listening, I'm so sorry to hear this, you didn't deserve this, you know, you shouldn't be ashamed, you aren't alone. And then mm -hmm. in responding, so you recognize that they're in a relationship, responding in a supportive way, and then telling them that help is available, not saying things like, you should just leave him. You know, that kind of it does, <laughs> yeah. it's not helpful to say that it comes across mm -hmm. as judgmental and it further isolates, I think, a survivor and, and feeling shameful, right? Mm -hmm. So just knowing that resources are out there and there are mm -hmm. many hotlines, mm -hmm. local agencies. Um, we have a, a, just a wealth of resources on our website at hawc.org. You don't have to live in Houston to learn about domestic violence and look at all the, the resources we have available. We have, um, you know, a PowerPoint on our nocovidabuse.org website where people can learn about domestic violence and a little YouTube video. So there's a lot of ways that people can get involved because they say, you know, how, how do I help? And I, I think that the, the, if, if you know somebody who's hurting or in a relationship, just be a supportive and listen without judgment and, and know that resources are available and share that with them. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard for women to even express it. So if you were to say that you were being abused in you know, a certain way and someone didn't validate that, a friend didn't validate it, but say, oh, just leave them as if it's no big deal. I would imagine that makes it even harder. Yeah, mm -hmm. it absolutely does. I mean, there's, there's this isolation and they don't get me and we hear it all the time. And you know, what, what we also hear is in support groups, that's when survivors are like, wow, that person who just shared that story was just like my story and I'm not alone. And that supportive group environment, you know, is also very healing for survivors. Um, right now, our support services have gone virtually, including support groups. But boy, we, we look forward to the day because there's such a power in, in, in coming together, right? In that circle, that sacred circle and sharing your experience and talking about, you know, your, your ordeal that, that is so healing for survivors. We can do that virtually, but we look forward to the day we can do it in person too. Yes, absolutely. Are you finding that the police are offering more protection or going further? I know there have been so many stories of women who have gotten um, protective orders that haven't done very much, but are there other options that if the police get involved that they can do? Yeah, protective orders are tricky, right? Sometimes they take too long and sometimes there's loopholes and gaps in the protective orders. You know, we have a great relationship with our local law enforcement authorities here. They are very committed to making sure that when a survivor, say, is at a scene and calls at a domestic abuse response team, D-A-R-T, and they have them all across the country, that model works, mm -hmm. right? Um, that you have not only an advocate at the scene and a social worker and a, a law enforcement and, and maybe the, the uh, prosecutor's office there, that all those survivor, uh, services are provided to survivors on site. 
So that's kind of like a one-stop oh, shop nice. instead of going okay. from, you know, you're at the, you're at the police scene at your home and then you're going to have to talk to the DA the next day at, you know, at the police or at the, at, at the county attorney's office and you have to go to, so the, so those are the kinds of things that can offer more support to survivors. And I think in working, working in sort of a collaborative way in communities, there's, I think there's a model called family justice. I don't know if you guys have that in your, in your community. I don't know. We'll check. Model. We'll check. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's basically a continuum of care for survivors. Okay. Family which is my, justice. Which mm -hmm. is my next question. So someone makes the phone call that they want to leave and they are successful in getting themselves and their children out and they go to a shelter. What services are then offered for them to get into a stable environment? So it's, it's, it's a process, right? So we, we run, and I'll, I'll kind of share it from our lens, and I know there are other agencies who do the same. We run a crisis uh, emergency shelter for anywhere from 30 to 90 days. Our average day with, with clients is about 47 to 51 days. Inside our shelter, there, there are just a full range of services, right? From uh, a school for children. We have a, 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 an independent school district, the, the public school. We also have uh, case management, so all the referral sources. We also have counseling, so they can, you know, begin their healing work, um, and and vocational education. So we have a vocational counselor who can help them find jobs if they need it. And so the next step would be housing, right? To apply for housing through our housing program. And there are options. Um, you know, there are HUD dollars. There's uh, federal monies for for rental vouchers. So there is a way, and I was just talking to a survivor the other day. She's been, you know, she stayed at the shelter for a number of months, went into transition housing for about a year, and then moved into her own apartment, is completely self-sufficient, and is so thankful. But, but she really had to do the work. You really have to be committed to, and she has a great job now, and she's doing okay during COVID. Um, so, so that's kind of the steps. Now, a lot of uh, survivors have family members that so they can get out on their own. Many of them come to us because of the wounds and the trauma they're suffering you know, just to address that as one layer, right? And then to, 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 to regain their independence and, and get a job and all those things uh, is, is it, 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 it's sort of a myriad of, of, of healing and, and, and self-determination at that point. And you have, yeah, and you the, just uh, said, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Colleen. No, I was just I was saying that say, you have the support groups also. So yeah. they're talking and, and sharing with yeah, and they can, there's no there's no um, expiration date for when you can go to counseling. We have survivors whose memories of trauma, sexual assault, domestic violence, were triggered many, many moons later, years later, and they're going into support group counseling, all free, all co confidential. Um, and we do it because of, I mean, it's Giving Tuesday today, you and I, and we're all talking today's Giving Tuesday. We do it with support of the community, you know, through donors mm -hmm. and government funds and, and corporate donors. And yeah, I mean, it takes a whole community. Right. And, and you both kind of just answered my next question was, <laughs> you know, when, sorry, <laughs> that's okay. That was, that was kind of what I was going to say. Um, once they've gone into the shelter and they've gone through the program and hopefully sounding like the survivor you spoke with that is in her own apartment now, um, that you continue that services are still available to them to continue yeah. to talk. Yeah, and, mm. and we have survivors who have been going to support for years, or maybe they come back, and maybe something, like I said, something might have triggered them, and they're just really needing that support. It's very powerful, and it's um, it's quite amazing and remarkable to me what they learn, right? That I don't have to be, this, this, this trauma doesn't have to define me, that mm -hmm. I'm worthy, that I'm okay, and that I have support, so, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and today is, yeah, today yeah. is one of those days where we say, hey, we, we're doing this work, but we can't do it alone, so. So Giving Tuesday, yes, to do that. that. Exactly. Yes. That, yes. You, now, you were, for 15 years, a journalist, oh. correct? Mm -hmm. oh, I'm getting into my personal story. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. But I'm curious how you made the transition from being an Emmy Award-winning journalist oh. to <laughs> going into um, the shelter. Yeah, so, Enter, I should call yeah, so I, you know, television news was in my blood for many, many years. I, I loved people's stories as a child, and I loved writing. So that was the perfect sort of combination of what I want to do in my career. So I was a, a news reporter and anchor in different various cities for many, many years. But in those years, I used to go out into communities who endured crisis and racial inequities and social inequities and financial inequities. And so I, I felt... 
I, I had this, this, this pulling towards service, right, to help people in crisis and, and connecting with people who, who didn't have all the advantages that we have, the privilege that we have. And so being a social worker, I it turned to get my master's in social work, I really wanted to continue to serve in some capacity and connect. And so for me, it was like I was a social worker in training all those years working in communities um, and looking at inequities. And so it seemed like a perfect transition. Now, initially I became a therapist and you know, worked um, sort of individual group counseling, children and teens. But, but, but what I love best is telling stories. And, and I get the privilege now of sharing the stories of, you know, of transformation, of triumph of our survivors, of our mission, and getting people engaged in this movement to end violence because it affects, it is so pervasive, it affects all of us. And so I, you know, I just get to, yeah, I get to do what I love and, and, and do it uh, with meaning and purpose. Lucky. And it's so important because what you're doing also is you're showing these children of these survivors that that's not okay. Yeah. What happened to their parent is not okay. And that hopefully it will stop yeah. the progression of the violence yeah. being passed Getting down. that cycle, right? Mm -hmm. so yes. That, right? If a child yes. is a survivor and is a witness to abuse or was abused him or else himself, him or herself, the propensity for that person to become an abuser is high. Yes, so you've got to yes. break that cycle. Talk about things like healthy relationships and consent. Mm -hmm. You don't teach social emotional learning, you know, at a mm -hmm. young age. You Absolutely. Don't, you don't go to relationship 101 in, in, in school. We don't, we don't teach how to. Right. Teach. And you're right. making a great point because it's not just the safety. There's so much emotional that goes with afterwards of breaking the cycle so it doesn't happen again. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it really is about, you know, at the end of the day, it's about being kind to one another and, and and looking at the other person is equal, but you know, there are so many barriers to that. Living in poverty, living in a violent relationship. There are a lot of barriers, right? And so mm -hmm. we see that in, in sort of that ecological whole and, and, and to prevent is to talk about it and to, you know, violence, what we know is a learned behavior. It's not like it's, you know, it is, is what you're exposed to. It can mm -hmm. be unlearned. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just so important for people to understand that that it can the cycle can be broken. It doesn't have to happen again. Um, can you share with us maybe one of the success stories that you've experienced? Oh, yeah. I know you probably have a lot, but yeah, yeah just one that stood it's out to you. Amazing stories. One woman who sticks out. She's amazing. Yeah, you know, she lived at our shelter. She was in a violent, violent relationship, and she finally called the shelter, and she was. They went to pick her up, and she was really at like a street corner at a dollar store. They picked her up. She had nothing with her and she just started her life anew. And she did not come from any amount of privilege, you know, so, some addiction in her past, some jail time in her past, a broken family, abuse in her home, sexual abuse, violence in her home. So she had a lot of barriers coming in, but she always knew that somewhere in her that she, she was good and that she could make it. Today, she lived at the shelter for five and a half months, got some housing, right? Like some, and then became, today is, um, get, she's going to get her master's in social work. She's getting her bachelor's. She's an LCDC, licensed chemical dependency counselor, and works at a homeless organization. She's, that's wonderful. Uh, that's amazing. amazing. Now, oh, the, now, and she's a homeowner. That was the other, that's right. That's she awesome. I mean, she's an amazing person. And, you know, I stay in touch with her. She was, she reached out the other day and she was trying to help a friend of her hers who she had no idea was in a an abusive relationship because often like you said we don't talk about it she said i had no idea mm -hmm. right that often i have no idea because people mm -hmm. are so ashamed you know there's no shame in saying I, I need help there's no shame in saying this happened to me it doesn't define you you know absolutely mm -hmm. so yeah that's that, and those are i mean and then you know sexual assault i was raped and i went to the hospital and this the, you know the the, the sexual assault trauma and what what your body endures after you go to the hospital and you know get an exam and um what she said was she was sexually assaulted by somebody she knew she ran away she got in a car they, they take her to the hospital you know it's all night and she said a hospital advocate which is what we do to, to we bring advocates to the hospital to, to offer support to survivors um you know that she offered her a fresh change of clothes and support. And that really stuck in her mind and gave her the phone number to our organization. And so she had been going to support 
counseling for sexual assault for a few years. And, you know, I just really learned a lot of, because, you know, the behavior, her behavior afterwards was, I hate myself. I blame myself. You know, what did I do? I shouldn't have gone out. And, and she recognized that she was not to blame. It wasn't her fault. Right. Um, and so those are the tools and she's doing great. She's thriving. Um, that she, that, yeah, she got at the Houston area women's center. That's, really awesome. powerful. That's wonderful. That's and wonderful. It, it is what you were saying. Blame is such a big, I think a lot of people, well, I aggravated him or, or yeah. I did this or something. Accepting the blame. It's gotta be so hard to shift that mindset to say, no, I did nothing to deserve this. This is not. Yeah. Drinking mm -hmm. doesn't warrant somebody climbing on top of you. You know, I, we hear mm -hmm. that a lot. Well, I was drunk. That's, that, that's that doesn't not matter. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And we're trying to shift, you know, the Me Too movement, Time's Up movement. I just want to shift that dialogue of victim blaming, right? To shift the blame. Absolutely. Not the and the onus on the server. Even, you know, I will say this, even during COVID and we were coming up with some language around how to cope in a home if you're living with an abuser, it was a slippery slope for our advocates because they said, you know, we don't want to put the onus on the survivor. This is a very unique circumstance. It's not, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be on the survivor to say, I need to do this. I need to do this. You know, how about the abuser needs to stop abusing me. Mm -hmm. right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And you're right. You have to be careful in how you word it. And yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how, so we are so happy to get the word out for all of this, but how can the average person help? What can people do? Simple acts of kindness are wonderful, mm -hmm. but when it comes to something like this, what can the average person who wants to help do? Well, I mean, if you see something, you say something. It goes back to that recognize, respond, and refer, right? Support mm -hmm. people who are suffering from abuse where they are. Listen without judgment. Tell them that resources are available. That can make a world of difference. You know, mm -hmm. and get engaged in your community. If you want to support survivors and you're a young professional or, you know, you want to volunteer in the hotlines, there's always a need there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this movement is so large because violence is so pervasive, unfortunately. Yes. We got a long ways to go, but I feel like we're, you know, we're, we're, we're making that shift, right? That shift in thinking. Mm -hmm. Just um, all these little things are coming. Yeah. When you talked about the Me Too movement, that's a big thing. That is a big shift. I saw probably the past three or four years where people are like, no, it's not because she dressed that way. It's, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, she can dress however she wants. And believing <laughs> survivors, I will tell you, I had this conversation, you know, being in news for so long, being in local news, we were in a place of practice as reporters where if somebody accused somebody of rape or violence, well, then it wasn't credible unless they went to the police. Well, we know that not to be true. A lot mm -hmm. of survivors, actually 90% of the cases are reported, it's underreported, right? Mm -hmm. That shift has already taken place in the media. I, and I had this conversation with a friend of mine who's, you know, an anchor in the local. He's like, well, she didn't go to the police, so I don't know if I want to talk to her. I said, Len, let me offer a little educational moment for you. Oh, yeah. The survivors we see, most of them don't go to the police. Because can you imagine how arduous it is to get interviewed? I mean, some of our child abuse cases take years. I mean, mm -hmm. years. A child might be six when they're abused. They might be 16 when they finally go to trial. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. It is, is, yeah. Yeah, and you know, from being a social worker and being a teacher, you know, right when you do the reporting and the investigation yeah. that goes on and everything involved, it will be forever before yeah. something happens. We have a children's court services, and that's what our advocates really hold the hands of child witnesses and child survivors of, of abuse, by and large mm -hmm. sexual abuse, and those cases drag on for years they do mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I worked as all, an, yeah. yeah i worked as an attorney for a guardian ad litem program and it the stories were horrific and mm -hmm. it as a, you know from a attorney's perspective you want to maintain some type of you know separation so you can argue but you just can't when it's involving children yeah. it's just mm -hmm. there it counts for so much more to get the rights terminated or to keep the child out of the home or to create a plan that will work. So I understand what you're saying. It just becomes personal. It really does when you see yeah. people struggling. And that's why you, what you were saying before, the three R's to, you know, validate, to offer service, to just, even if you just know the 800 number for the national yeah. hotline that you yeah. can give somebody, that's yeah. something. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is something. You know, and, and these days with our cell phones, you just Google it, right? Mm -hmm. right. You're going to find it.
We and are, that was, we are lucky. We're, that there is a shift in this movement. Yes. yes. And that was another thing that um, I just wanted to make people aware that it's not just an 800 number. You can also text. Yep. There's online programs. So it's not as just like you have to call now. You can get, there's lots of ways to get in touch for help. Yeah, there is, there is. And you know, you just Google and you learn so much, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chad. Is there anything that we missed or anything that you think is important for our listeners to know that we have not talked about? I, want to make sure. I, I just, you know, I, I think our message is really clear that, you know, if you're in an abusive relationship, know that you're not alone know that you can be believed that you are believed it's not your fault and that help is available that's really the message we send out and it can be a light switch for so many people suffering help is available you're not alone you are to be believed it's not your fault those are the kinds of supportive uh, statements you can make when you find yourself or a friend who's suffering mm -hmm. well thank you that's very powerful and i hope it that is. the listeners i hope yes absorb it, that anybody listening or anybody that knows anyone that is going through this, just let them know that message. I love the three R's. It makes it simple to remember it too. Yeah. Recognize, mm -hmm. respond, refer. Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> Be something, say something. Yeah. I, I yeah. Those yes. <laughs> Absolutely. They're all coming out. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you so much, Chad. We, thank we you really so appreciate much. your time. Yes. I'm so glad thing. you guys are, yeah. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you guys are, are doing this podcast and sharing it with women of our of our, of our midlife <laughs> midlife stage <laughs> and beyond because really, it does happen yeah. and it's not <laughs> too okay. late it's and, exactly. and also it's not too late if you're midlife and it's still it's happened for years you can still get out oh, of this yeah. Oh, yeah absolutely yeah that's a sad thing about thing. violence as you guys know it, it, there's no discrimination it is no discrimination mm -hmm. age race gender all those things right yeah it, it happens mm -hmm. yeah well, thank you. We really appreciate your time. Yeah. And we just hope that um, the word gets out more and more with every voice and every interview because it's such an yeah. important thing to hear about. Yeah. And hashtag no COVID abuse. So yes, thank you. Yes. And it's nocovidabuse.org, hawk.org. Take a look at all the resources and information we have available. We'll have that all in the show notes too. Yes, so right. have, mm -hmm. a look. have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you so much.